live now. Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, one of the events that um, North Africa Initiative and the Forum Policy Institute at SAIS uh, is organizing. Um, the topic or the focus of today is China and its role in North Africa. Um, it, most of those who are uh, China watchers know that China is expanding its presence across Africa. Um, but uh, also North Africa in particular. Uh, it, 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 we, we'd like to, to look into, I mean, it has both bilateral and multilateral uh, partnerships, uh, specifically with Morocco, with Tunisia. Uh, Algeria, of course, is a big player there. Uh, it's also, I think, now starting uh, uh, to enter into Libya, even though the political situation is still not very, uh, very uh, stable. Uh, I, this is, you know, apart from its expansion throughout Africa. Uh, the question we have is uh, to have a, a little bit of, of background on China's uh, presence in this region and why is it interested in this region specifically and at how is it presenting itself as the more more reliable uh, uh, partner than than the United States or Europe which were the traditional allies or traditional trading partners for for this part of the world also to talk a little bit about the marine uh, silk road sort of side of, of the silk road that that goes through uh, North Africa, I think Egypt specifically, uh, across the, the Med. So without delaying this, uh, our main speaker today is Dr. Mordochai, uh, who's joining us from Israel today, who did extensive research on this. And I'm gonna start with him. Uh, let me just one um, housekeeping thing. Uh, those who are joining us on Zoom, uh, please uh, uh, send any questions you have through the chat function, not the, without raising your hands. We will take some questions from the room here specifically, and then we'll ask some of the questions that are on Zoom. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll keep it in time without actually any delays. Uh, Dr. Mordechai, welcome to SAIS. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a little bit late for you. It's about eight o'clock, I think, over there. Seven. Ah, uh, seven. Uh, seven. Okay. Uh, so please go ahead. <clears throat> okay, I want to share my presentation. Okay. Hello to everyone. A study examined the place of the macro region in China's BRI grant strategy. China ultimate strategic pursuit of grant strategy mainly aimed to place China back in the center of the world and reach a basic strategic balance with the West. The BRI is designed to reshape China economic geographic by promoting connectivity with oversized markets, placing China in the center of the Eurasian logistic network and making Beijing two ocean country, boarding the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. In broader sense, the BRI seeks to reshape China's international surrounding activity rather than adopting them specifically as before. The BRI play a key role in fulfilling the Chinese dream and something the Communist Party of leaderships. This assertive foreign policy, the little uh, disambition initiative countered by weakening West, power influence in the BRI countries and challenging its global leaderships in the lib liberal international order. My central thesis is that the, the macro region is integral to the new Silk Road grant strategy. This, the partnership between China and North African countries, El Beijing effectively manage and control its energy, goods, or product needs, and open a new markets and trade world. China is, has mainly successfully employed strategic partnerships or relationships as a prominent instrument in its limited diplomatic toolkit to guarantee integration between the local country's needs and the BRI 
vision. All Magra state are maritime economic strategy located between European advanced economics across the Mediterranean Sea to the north and high potential developed in Sub-Saharan Africa to the south. Geogeographical, given their location adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, Maghreb countries have historically been more oriented to Europe than other region. Former colonial powers, France, Italy, and Spain see the North African country as strategic for economic, political, and security region. Nevertheless, since the beginning of the 21st century, the Maghreb has become a focus of the West. Considerable attention, especially at the security level, doubt the war against tourism. China present in the Maghreb have also become evident, especially in energy, construction, and infrastructure projects. Since the Chinese President Xi Jinping announced in the BRI, the Maghreb countries have joined this initiative and signed memorandum of, of, of standing and partnership agreement. As a result, China and North African countries' economic ties significantly change the region, nature, and balance of power of relations. Over the past years, China has gradually consolidated its economic presence in the Maghreb countries regarding trade, investment, and infrastructure projects. Beijing has become actively active in these countries, focusing on bilateral relations while also working when the form of China-Asia cooperation, the Union of the Arab Maghreb, and the China-Arab State Cooperation Forum. The economic ties between China and the Maghreb countries have grown exponentially, growing, growing, um, uh, especially when we uh, went to Algeria, growing the closest relationship. The trade between China and North African countries grew to almost $24 billion last year. Its investment and contracts between 2013 and, and, to, and to 2022 stood at $23.4 billion when Algeria received the lion share of $11.7 billion, as you can see in this, in this table. Partnership diplomacy has become a primary foreign policy tool for China's grand strategic objective. Building strategic partnerships worldwide has become one of the Chinese diplomacy most important business and instrument. The partnership diplomacy style established between Beijing and the Maghreb state indicate how the parties have upgraded their diplomatic, economic, and cultural relations, particularly since the BRI launch. China has established two strategic partnerships in the Maghreb region when Morocco and Algeria, and Algeria the latter has been on cooperative level. However, while China has signed an agreement when reset, uh, a reset of the North countries, it has yet established a formal partnership with Tunisia, Libya, or Mauritania. Its growing presence in this country remains primarily economy. However, China's role in the, in the Maghreb is still developing, rooted chiefly in economic interests, cultural exchange, and diplomacy. China increases in tides when these countries center mainly on trade, infrastructure projects, port, shipping, financial cooperation, tourism, and manufacturing. China can be expected and to expand and deep this connection in this coming year, given the, Mar the, given the Maghreb strategic geographic location. Now I want to focus the most interesting portrait of China, the connectivity. The BRI target is, is the network of trade connectivity throughout Africa. This means connectivity among North African countries, countries the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan. For instance, bringing Algeria as a gateway to Europe and Africa into China MSRI scheme will further increase China's shipping capabilities in the Mediterranean basin. The port of al in Churchill may be vital for China's export goods to the Mediterranean North, Northern Shore. Morocco, strategic geographic location as a gateway to Europe, only eight miles away from the continent, and its notable presence in the Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the Arab world would allow it to become a regional hub in China, MSRI. For, interest, for instance, Muhammad VI uh, uh, Tangier Tech City construction is one of the largest Chinese investment projects in the Maghreb. 
Tunisia occupied occupies a highly strategic geographic location at the crossroad road between Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Thank, thank to its location in the center of North Africa, the middle of the Mediterranean region close to vital shipping road between Europe and Africa continents. Tunisia serves as an ideal middleman to control passage between critical regions for the MSRI. Mauritania is also critical to the MSRI and its grounded in position on the Atlantic coast and sub-Saharan Africa, where China aspires to expand its presence and influence. At a, at a geographical critical exchange point between North and Sub-Saharan Africa, the North African country geopolitical location on the Atlantic coast make it a, juncture, a, a critical juncture for the China MSRI. Energy security is also China key concern in the Maghreb region. Algeria, one of the world's largest production and exporters of energy. Nevertheless, its oil export to PRC remain a, a small compared to its energy export to the European countries. Libya, an OPEC member, a winter large growth reserves in Africa and, and an oil rich country connected to the Mediterranean Sea and Sub-Saharan Africa. Does Algeria is significant oil and gas suppliers and one of the Chinese 15 crowd oil suppliers. Although China is still deciding whether to take on a leadership role in the Maghreb region, its economic weight is slowly, slowly challenges out their traditional external actor strategic interests, mainly the US and Europe. China introduction, multipolarity of the region provide local players went a new bargain tool in their relationship, relationship with the West countries. This will impact the regional balance of power and stability of the region with far-reaching implications for, for, Europe, for European interests in the long run. As North African countries use China to diversify their political and economic ties away from the West, this trend significantly impacts the EU and the US politi political leverage. China positions itself as an indispensable partner of the Maghreb and viable alternative partner to the West, leading the North African country to expand their cooperation with NPRC, not only on the economic and cultural matter, but also on diplomacy and defense issue. Moreover, given its geopolitical importance, Washington has a wide range of interests in the Maghreb uh, region, spanning energy, religious extreme, immigration, and so Does continue China's presence in an engagement when the new in, when the North African country will jeopardize Western power projection capabilities across the Maghreb region and extensively across the continent? Now I want to show you my key finding. The Maghreb region is integral to the new Silk Road Grand strategy. China has mainly successfully employed strategic partnership or relationships as a permanent instrument in its limited diplomatic, diplomatic toolkit to guarantee integration between local country needs and the BRI, BRI vision. The Maghreb countries are welcome China's presence and showing agents to become involved in its ambition BRI framework. The partnership diplomacy tool has provided China a platform to deepen and expand its cooperation when the mega countries under the BRI grant strategy. Chinese partnership when the mega state broadly tend to correspond on three major categories of partnership. Potential partnership with Tunisia, strategic partnership with Morocco, and comparative strategic partnership with Algeria. China interdependence level when these countries have increased in recent years, spending many interests for, interest, for inter, instance, energy security, trade cooperation, and infra, infrastructure construction. The MSRI has targeted the key port in the Mediterranean Sea and bringing the Maghreb key port into the fold would further both Chinese shipping capability in the Mediterranean Basin the Maghreb region has developed into a central node in the Chinese Maritime Silk Road strategy. Connected by planet and efficient port pipelines, railways, and power plants built and founded by Chinese companies and lenders. 
This mangrove trade road to help the PLC diversity its supply chains and create China, Indian Ocean, Africa, Mediterranean Sea, blue economic passage to connect Africa to the new, new maritime economic corridors in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. For China, the opportunity to contribute and to exploit the Maghreb region potential as a trans-Mediterranean and trans-Sub-Saharan -Saharan trade hubs through its infrastructure project and manufacturing localization is actually appealing primarily goal of the PRI, of, of, of the BRI framework. China, China pursues bilateral agreement when individual Maghreb government based on shared interests rather than a common third perspective. This allowed Beijing to avoid being go down in the Maghreb region when serve political commitment as well in the case in pan-regional alien structure, but to increase its room for maneuver and discretion to act more fairly. The successful implement of the BRI grant strategy in the Maghreb region challenged how the traditional external actor strategic interests mining the US and Europe. The balance of global political will certainly affect by China's Maghreb emerging partnership and the governance of interests. Introduction multipolarity in the Maghreb provide local players with a new bargaining tool in their relationship with the Western countries. This could impact the regional balance of power and stability of the region with far-reaching implication on European interest in the long run. It is unlikely that China wished to establish hegemony in the Maghreb region, but it would probably like to see the less West influence. It seems unlikely that China will soon replace European geopolitical power in the Maghreb. Nevertheless, as Washington disengaged for its traditional global leadership's rule, Europe losing its vital security partner, this geopolitical development means that Western powers are losing their ability to influence the Mediterranean region security dynamics. Overall, the Maghreb region's strategic location means that China's new Silk Road grant strategy will only continue to expand, especially in the economic sphere. There is a, finally, there is a connection between PRC emerging partnership with the North African countries and the new Silk Road grant strategy. Therefore, the key to understand China's advocate involvement in the region must be in the context of the BRI framework. That's all. Thank you. Time putting up your presentation on the screen, but it will be posted, I promise you, by tomorrow on our website, uh, on the FBI website, uh, North Africa Initiative. And it will be presented next to the to the video uh, of this room. Um, so it's uh, my my sincere apologies, but uh, it, technically it's not working. So just bear with us, and we will be happy to send you a copy of 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 the presentation tomorrow if you just send us an email. But you'll find it on the website. Lena, let me go to you for your uh, five-minute intervention, and then we'll move on to uh, Ten Hinan, and then we'll open it up for more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the FPI uh, colleagues for their invitation to uh, join you today. Um, so um, I I'm going to just make a few broad uh, remarks and also maybe uh, throw in a few questions for uh, discussion if we have time to to get to them. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate our colleague for the publication of the book. Um, it is very important to study uh, with nuance China's uh, presence um, in Africa, China's influence in Africa, uh, and uh, Maghreb countries uh, specifically show us a bit more nuance in terms of learning more 
uh, about China in the global south, China in Africa, and so on and so forth. And so um, uh, taking a deep dive into the region and studying the nuance and, and the differences in the, in the different cases is, is, is very welcome and extremely important. Um, and so to uh, just give a few comments, uh, what uh, uh, from listening to the presentation and uh, from uh, what I could gain uh, out of the book, uh, trying to to read parts of it uh, that were available to 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 me to 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 read and look at. Um, so it's, it it seems we can talk about uh, three uh, general trends when we are discussing China Maghreb uh, relations. Of course, uh, in 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 this contemporary moment, not going uh, going uh, uh, all the way back in history, uh, as one can do. Uh, but it seems one of the trends uh, we could talk about is um, uh, 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 that, that that Maghreb countries uh, are uh, extremely important for China's uh, foreign policy making and for China's uh, China, China's influence uh, in, on a number of levels, as we have heard from the presentation, in terms of energy uh, cooperation, in terms of connectivity, specifically uh, shipping capabilities, access to sea line, uh, uh, sea communication lines. Um, as well as also important in terms of political and diplomatic uh, standing, the, the, the comprehensive strategic partnerships um, on the various other levels that, that were outlined to us in the, in the presentation kind of show uh, uh, that importance uh, uh, from the political diplomatic side. Uh, also, historically speaking, uh, thinking back to China-Algeria uh, relations, for example, in the 1950s and 60s and sort of that kind of uh, uh, the, the the political uh, enduring friendship, as I heard somebody say uh, earlier before the the panel even started. <laughs> so this enduring friendship, really, we 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 see it very well uh, present in 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 a number of China uh, Maghreb uh, uh, states relations. The second trend uh, that I want to highlight. Uh, is is that Maghreb countries also sit in very in, in this very uh, 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 special uh, and exceptional position vis-a-vis -vis China, um, and and this position is is allows them to be countries that kind of cooperate with China uh, on two fronts. Uh, one is obviously sort of the uh, China Africa uh, platform, and we uh, uh, here can think about the forum on China Africa relations, which uh, Maghreb countries are uh, part and parcel of, but also really uh, China's uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the, the West Asia part of the, the WANA, right? So West Asia and North Africa, sort of the, the Middle East, otherwise known as the sort of China's um, uh, kind of foreign policy uh, 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 in the Middle East or in the region um, uh, through the CASCAF, which is the China Arab State Forum. So Maghreb countries sit in this very interesting position where they can collaborate and cooperate with China based on this kind of uh, uh, China's policy and, and platforms for Africa, as well as for the Arab states and, and sort of uh, uh, the Middle East uh, region. Um, and uh, 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 there is also a, an interesting part about the Maghreb countries um, that pose a bit of a challenge as well to China, uh, uh, precisely because um, China is, or Chinese companies, for example, are always in competition with uh, a, a variety uh, of actors when it comes to Maghreb countries. So, uh, you know, China's uh, influence is challenged by uh, companies and actors from Turkey, from Russia, from the European Union, from Gulf states, uh, and so on and so forth. And so this is really also an, is an interesting trend to, to kind of look at uh, the extent to which China's influence is challenged by all of these uh, external actors that are very much present in, in the Maghreb. Um, um, and uh, uh, it, the third trend, I would say, is kind of complementing the second one in, in saying that despite Maghreb countries sitting in this very interesting position, very intriguing position that can allow them to uh, cooperate and to negotiate with China on a variety of, of levels, there still is a lot of potential, but has not necessarily actually been realized to, to the fullest extent. Um, and here we can talk about the trade volume deficits, right? So we have uh, seen from the presentation and we know that China has become the largest trading partner uh, of, of Maghreb countries 
uh, and and it's been a number of years now. And sort of we saw sort of the the the, the table that uh, tells us about China's investment and trades in the region and how they've been sort of increasing. So all of these are good signs. But then when we look at the trade deficits, that these are signs that look at uh, the amount of potential that these countries can actually negotiate and realize in the relations with Beijing that has not necessarily been uh, bankable so far. So whereas you know we we talked we we heard earlier a bit about Tunisia, for example, with a strategic location that it can be playing. But at the same time, we know, for example, that Tunisia has not necessarily sort of banked. Um, uh, 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 on uh, all the potential that exists there uh, in terms of its 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 relations with 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 China. Same thing can be said about Algeria. Relations kind of seem to be um, really kind of uh, more perhaps uh, uh, um, uh, prominent on the discourse level, on the ideology side level, on sort of that solidarity. Uh, but in you know when it comes to investments, when it comes to trade deficits, a lot can be done there to kind of you know uh, take take advantage of this Belt and Road Initiative framework or to the, the, the GSI, the GDI uh, is is what we are hearing about uh, more recently. Um, so with this uh, with the, with this in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll transfer it over to uh, to my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Tinhinan Al Kadi to hear uh, her remarks, and uh, I'll stand by uh, for for questions um, uh, uh, if we have time for that. Thank you. Thank you, Lina, very very much. Uh, let's go very quickly to uh, Dr. Uh, Tinhinan, uh, who is in London, uh, and if we can keep the remarks a little bit shorter, so we'll have some time to to get questions going okay Please. thank you for the invitation and i will do my best to keep it as, as as possible so uh thanks a lot for the presentation i thought it was very interesting um i just have a few remarks um on the content i haven't yet read the the book i haven't yet had the opportunity to do so but i'm looking forward to it so first of all i think it's important to situate the maghreb uh, in a broader scheme, potentially at like the Middle East and North Africa, for instance, or the rest of the African continent, the Maghreb is actually not such a significant economic actor when it comes to trade with China. So just raw numbers, uh, for instance, the GCC, the Gulf, uh, you know, register something around 170 billion US dollars of exchange of total trade volumes with China. Whereas the Maghreb, if you add even Egypt to it, which is an important economic partner to China in the region, we're counting in total something around 30 billion US dollars annually. So I'm combining all of like uh, all North African countries. So it's not such a significant economic relationship. Uh, however, it has been growing through years and it has certainly taken a more strategic turn uh, since the Belt and Road Initiative was announced. I think one important thing to, to mention, and I guess there wasn't enough time uh, in the presentation and Lina, Lina came uh, uh, mentioned this briefly, is really the political capital that is at the foundation of China's relation with the Maghreb, especially with Algeria, and which kind of like uh, results today in the highest type of diplomatic relations China can have with a country that is a, a strategic comprehensive uh, partnership. It has one with Algeria and another one with uh, Egypt in North Africa. And so the relationship between China and North Africa can be traced back to the 1950s where China actually played a significant role in the liberation movement of North African countries. And it has backed the FLN and built a, a strong friendship with Algeria uh, since these times. Um, when it comes to, to energy, uh, I think it's, it's also important to mention that uh, North African countries and Maghreb countries are actually not significant exporters of energy to, to China. Uh, Libya was the most significant exporter of oil and gas to, uh, of mainly crude oil to Beijing. But since the Arab Spring, since 2012, we've seen a significant drop in Libyan energy exports to Beijing, even though the numbers have picked up again recently. Most of Algeria's oil and gas goes to, to its southern European partners. Uh, however, since I think mainly China's 2016 
uh, Arab initiative, we've seen a, some sort of qualitative turn in China's engagement with the region. Uh, because, you know, traditionally the economic relationship between Maghreb countries and China has reproduced patterns of unequal trade, whereby you had China mainly buying um, little kind of low value added products from North African countries in agriculture or like some energy products, whereby Maghreb countries importing finished manufactured goods from China. But this relationship is still very much present, but we've seen more interest from China in investing in kind of more strategic sectors, more manufacturing. In Morocco, for instance, there is this big project of building a smart city in Tanger, uh, Tanger Tech City. And this is one of like the highlights and like the, the hallmarks of, the, of China's digital presence in the region. We've seen some major uh, investments in the ICT sector. Huawei is an important actor in the region. Uh, it has built uh, the bulk of the 3G infrastructure in all Maghreb countries and is very much likely to continue doing so uh, with expanding 4G and 5G networks in, in the region. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the Maritime Silk Road, uh, uh, our colleague was right to, to mention that it's a very strategic aspect of uh, uh, China's relations with the Maghreb. Uh, the Hamdaniya port uh, is uh, definitely one of the most important BRI projects in the Mediterranean. However, lately, due mainly to like political reasons, it has stalled. So uh, I, I visited the site actually six months ago in Algeria, we, we don't see much uh, on, on that front. Um, uh, won't be long. Uh, I just want to, to say maybe to conclude that, uh, you know, it's, it's important to have nuance when we, we talk about China's engagement with the region. Obviously, China is not a good actor. We've seen a lot of tensions on the ground. I, I just came back from over a year of field work between private Chinese firms in the region and, and there is often a mismatch. It's not one cohesive group. Uh, and and it's, it's important to see that China's engagement in the region is different from the one of, of Washington or the one like the European Union. Because I would say that, and this actually came back during some of my interviews during fieldwork for, for my PhD, while well, like Washington has been viewing the region like that, as a main source of threat, and as like a key partner in the fight against terrorism and so on, China is viewing the region as this economic opportunity. So for leaders in the region, it's a very different relationship whereby, you know, China is very much seen as a partner for economic development in a way that, as it stands, other partners are not necessarily positioning themselves uh, in a similar way way. I'm going to stop here to leave enough space for the debate, but thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, it's really interesting to me that the, the one key message that I think all three of you agreed on, and I happen to agree with it, is that the relationship of China to North Africa or even to Africa in general is quite different from the relationship or the view from Washington, at least that for them, for Washington, it's an issue of terrorism, of dealing with threats, uh, or even competition with China. In some way, it's a, it comes from a negative perspective, whereas China is engaging with the region based on opportunities that uh, are shared interest. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna forfeit my right to, to, to ask so many questions. So I'm going to open it for the room here to uh, anybody who wants to ask a question. OK, I will take two or three questions at a time. And then we'll please go ahead and introduce yourself, please, first. OK, thanks for your presentations. My name is Sabina Henneberg. I'm from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Yes. Um, I'm interested specifically in Tunisia. Just based on your research, uh, uh, how do you think the kind of mounting political instability in Tunisia will affect China's presence there. Is it for a specific person or for the group? Uh, for anyone. Okay. Uh, somebody here raised their hand? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask... Um, introduce yourself, please, oh, for our yes. speakers. Sorry. Uh, my name is Eva Suikova. I'm a 
uh, visiting research fellow uh, at SAIS. Um, I'm doing research on China's influence in Sub-Saharan Afri Africa mostly. My question is um, about um, North African states agency uh, with uh, you know uh, connection to to cooperation with China and the interplay in the domestic politics. Like for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, mainly in Angola, we can observe that the ruling elite is using the project in order to empower itself and remain in power. Um, so um, I wanted to ask: Is this also the case in uh, North Africa? And uh, what projects are being uh, used in order to, you know, the ruling peri uh, elites to remain in power there? Okay, let's go ahead and answer these two questions and then we'll, we'll see how many other questions come up. Please, uh, you're, since the questions are not directed at a specific person, please, uh, we'll, we'll just go quickly around uh, for all speakers to contribute to, to answering this question. Dr. Mordochai, if you can start us off. The question of the instability in, in Tunisia, and uh, uh, your question is on uh, on the on on empowering ruling elites through the okay implementation oh. of projects. Okay, so so please, Dr. Mordochai. I hear all I hear all the first question. The second, I not hear it, but I think the political stable in Tunisia or in uh, everything every. North African countries, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not unlikely that uh, it will um, influence the Chinese uh, uh, engagement in the country. You, you can see this in uh, Libya, where is the civil war, uh, and in Tunisia, the stable political. Uh, the, the, the Chinese came to do business. They are, uh, do not care who, uh, what, uh, what is going in the country, but uh, in the last years, because the uh, economic situation in China, they are very careful about their investment. As I said in the presentation, if you see, if you see the invitation, invest, 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 investment uh, uh, in the MAGA, they are very small. So there are no there are no many risk for a, a, a Chinese investment. I think the investment in Tunisia uh, in the last year was zero. Yeah, no, yes, uh, no, yes, zero. Yeah, there are no there are no there are no there are, uh, not uh, investment in the ten years. Um, so I think uh, one of the reason maybe. Uh, the political uh, stability influenced the, uh, the diplomatic uh, relationship uh, between the countries, but I think because the uh, strategic location of Tunisia, as I said, uh, uh, the Chinese very um, uh, want uh, Tunisia to become more friend and she has a potential to be a strategic partnership. But it's but it's but it's uh, depend on the political stability in uh, Tunisia. About the okay. second question, I do not hear it, so I cannot answer. The the question basically involves how is China uh, maybe empowering uh, uh, the political elite in these countries uh, by its relationship. If we can be very brief, please, in the answer. Did you hear me? Yes, but I don't know. I don't. I don't. I do not have answer for this. I know. All right, Lena, and uh, if you can address the, these two questions, please. Okay, thank you. So I'll uh, start with the second one. Um, and the question is, yes, whether Chinese investments in uh, North Africa mirror something similar that we see uh, some scholars and 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 um, observers. Uh, uh, analyze about China's investments being used by ruling elites to basically stay in power or to direct Chinese investments to areas where uh, some of the voter, uh, you know, uh, basically base comes from. Um, so it, you know, that, that's kind of really interesting. It points at a very interesting uh, and important um, 
perhaps distinction in some way, uh, which is to say sort of the, the question that came from the floor talked specifically about Angola. Angola is a very interesting case because of the so-called Angola model. And we remember the Angola model for sort of this idea of swapping, right? So, so a country would have natural resources and it would engage in swapping those natural resources for strategic investments in infrastructure, right? So this swap uh, natural resource for uh, infrastructure uh, has uh, been observed in Angola and has been used sort of as a, as a, as a, um, a model to speak about similar situations. So um, perhaps one distinction between, for example, Algeria uh, and Angola would be this idea that the this, this swap model just does not necessarily exist, right? So what we have instead, when it comes to infrastructure uh, cooperation with China, uh, between Algeria and China, we have uh, mostly the, the, the sort of Algerian government taking advantage of prices of, 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 of um, uh, uh, energy, right? So the, the prices um, of, of uh, uh, specifically oil prices going up uh, and oil and gas prices going up in the early 2000s, mid 2000s uh, to basically contract Chinese companies to come and, and build a lot of infrastructure projects. That's, that relationship is very different from sort of this swap, right? So energy for infrastructure swap. Um, but uh, so, so, so it, it, it's kind of really interesting to talk about that, but, but it's also really interesting to maybe dig into the concept of agency a little bit and understand what agency we what do we mean by agency so is agency always something that's necess necessarily always good is it something that we should question so this idea of uh, elites kind of using and deploying investments for their own benefits i mean does that really count as agency is that part of sort of the definition of what agency is or is that just sort of you know individuals Kind of benefiting uh, for for their own instead of sort of agency understood as sort of that contributing to welfare to the welfare of the the, the, the public the state the, the 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 people in general so it's really interesting to kind of really ponder that a little bit uh, on the question of Tunisia I don't have a lot more to add um, uh, 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 but I'll say that it's kind of you know for, as as a political scientist what's really interesting to me about the case of Tunisia is that there has been almost kind of a, a running thesis that somehow where countries, sort of China's investments tend to go or increase in areas that have political instability. So this argument has been kind of talked about in the context of several African uh, countries to say, uh, places where there are there is political instability, you'll see Chinese companies interested in coming in with investments, and and so the the, the question you know that Tunisia poses before us with this idea of zero uh, kind of you know investments in the last year really kind of puts 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 you know a break to some of these kind of you know big trends that can be observed on some you know kind of really uh, uh, high level. Maybe it's a sign necessarily... that Tunisia is very stable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, precisely. Right? So if we take but, that as face value, it would tell us that Tunisia is very stable when it's not that, in a sense. So yeah. It, Lina, sorry to cut you off, but uh, I have there is an interesting question that ties into the to the issue of Tunisia. So I'm going to throw it in, and it comes from a, a dear colleague, Amy, uh, Amy uh, Hotter from uh, POMAD, which is the uh, project on Middle East democracy here in DC, and she's asking specifically: uh, Do you believe that China has shown any specific interest in Tunisian ports, uh, in, in particular the port of? Uh, uh, Right this, I think, uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah. So uh, can you uh, add to that in, in your answer and then maybe uh, Tin can also uh, incorporate it in her reply on Tunisia? Okay, um, I have not necessarily come across much uh, on uh, investments in, in, in port and rads. Uh, what I have been actually following was um, something a little bit different in China-Tunisia relations, which is related to actually um, a party school. So there's this, there, there's this project of building a, um, a, a political, a sort of an elite training school uh, that the Tunisian government entered into agreement with China to actually build the school, but also, also I've been following a little bit to see kind of what beyond just the construction of the physical building, what else is included in the in the in in that sort of elite to elite kind of party to party ties um, uh, between Tunisia and 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 China. And I think it's a very interesting and growing kind of relationship. But let me transfer it over to uh, to Tin Hinan to tell us a little bit more about Brads and other things. Thank you very much. Please, uh, Tenhenan, if you can jump in. 
Thanks. So the the question about uh, Tunisia, well, it, it's it's a, an important one. I mean, so far what we know is, I mean, things are changing uh, quite fast in Tunisia at the moment. With the, it's, it's clearly taking an authoritarian turn. Um, what we can, I mean, we can answer the question by comparing. Uh, China's reactions to other popular movements and other significant political changes in other North African countries. And what we know recently in Algeria after the Herat movement, the popular pro-democracy uh, movement, uh, we haven't seen significant you know, changes in China's uh, presence in the country. So as long as uh, Chinese economic interests are not directly impacted, uh, I don't think that you will see any uh, obviously, interference from uh, from the Chinese side. The Chinese uh, still hold on their non-interference uh, policy, and so uh, as long as business continues, really, uh, I don't see much difference in China in Tunisia. Libya was an interesting case because uh, when, uh, when violence started in Libya, you had uh, kind of like. It was one of the first experiences of China having to handle, uh, we're counting something around over 300,000 citizens who were at the time working in Libya. And it had, there was this, this emergency in Chinese diplomacy where it had to like uh, protect its citizens and fly them to, to, to Beijing. But that's the very next to what's happening in China now. So, uh, short answer would be no. I, I wouldn't expect any significant change. And also Tunisia, in the grand scheme of things, is not very important for, for Beijing. Um, this being said, regarding the rats uh, port, um, like in the big picture, China is interested in ports in the southern shores of the Mediterranean. So all North African countries have uh, preferential trade agreements with the EU. And then in the context of increasing uh, trade and increased sanctions against Chinese goods, there is a strategy to relocate some of Chinese manufacturing in North Africa and use these ports to be able to export uh, towards European markets. Right, uh, but so far uh, uh, the, the red sport has not emerged as like a, a significantly strategic. Definitely, the Chinese in the Mediterranean are focusing more on uh, the Tanger port in Morocco and the Amdenia port in Algeria. Not yet, yet been been. been. The question be interesting uh, and I think it's a very important point when we talk about China's presence in North Africa because you know we shouldn't portray it as like just China imposing its will on these countries these countries obviously have their own development strategy on political strategy and it's always a bar and negotiation with China and it has often uh, in some cases yeah been in place because uh, Chinese firms come very competitive pricing when it comes to building infrastructure. And infrastructure building, we know, and there is a large around the top, uh, you know, pe people in power. So, so in a way, uh, I, I would say that in Algeria, at least, definitely something that has helped, uh, you know, the, the, the people in power, uh, in power. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lynn. I'm, I'm gonna throw a question here from me. Uh, I, I'm wondering the sustainability of the uh, Maghreb-Sino relationship, um, especially when you take in consideration all the other com competitors uh, that are trying to compete for the region, uh, whether it's the United States, whether it's also Russia. Uh, wh where does that, how, how would Chinese interest in the region and in Africa in general, um, will be able to manage this kind of competitiveness that is, some of it is plain anti-China uh, policies, not even necessarily because they wanna invest in the region or because the region is historically important. I mean, Washington sees China as a, as a, a competitor and a foe in many parts of the world, especially on the economic issues. And I wonder how that is gonna affect the relationship with Washington. Any other questions we can throw in? Uh, 
Then you always have a great question or remark. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? Please. Um, I, I actually have uh, a couple questions. So the first one is has to do with the lens that we look at the relationship between uh, China and the Maghreb region. Um, is it better to, we kind of often assume it's kind of a, a state to state government relationship, but is there also a kind of a, uh, um, a relationship between the private sectors that that's interesting and I'm wondered what um, our, our speakers have thought about that and uh, a kind of a follow up to that. Is there any sort of uh, indication that China is uh, working with uh, informal forms of in, uh, credit or investment such as um, like local I, I think it's I might be murdering this word but uh, like the Hawala system. Yeah. Um, and, and do they do they uh, inter interact at that informal level as well? Please, uh, it, well, let's start with with then uh, uh, Hinan this time since uh, she was the last one to speak. Please, do you want to jump in and answer these two questions about the sustainability of Chinese relationship with the region, given the uh, you know the big power competition and that it is facing, especially from Washington. And then the second question is about the, real, the two things. One is the is there any significant uh, relation economic relationship between the pri with the private sector in North Africa rather than the states? And uh, uh, the second question is about the, uh, the financing uh, uh, of these projects uh, and uh, do they use an informal networks of finance uh, or an informal network of uh, I don't know. Um, credit uh, funding and so on, like the Hawala system. Thanks Please. a lot for these uh, great two questions. Um, okay, so the first question about the viability and sustainability of the relationship. I think, yeah, when you, you trace the relationship of the PRC Maghreb country, the long relationship that can be, again, like back to the early days, the PRC. So I think it's very much there to remain. Uh, especially North African countries see Beijing as an alternative to the, the Washington country in a way, as a, an alternative when it comes to uh, developing paradigms, you know. And considering the political situation in North Africa, the Chinese model is a very attractive model for most of the leaders across the region. So whether about in Egypt or the, the current uh, Tabun in Algeria at the moment. Uh, the Chinese model where you can combine economic development with authoritarianism is an attractive model for, for the countries in place, without a doubt. And, you know, at the same time, that comes funding for <coughs> that comes either from the China Development Bank or the China Exim Bank, which are like the two main uh, Chinese financiers of development projects in the region. And, and China comes also with a lot of uh, willingness, uh, at least at the discursive level, to train people, to train officials, to uh, train university students. You have lots of scholarships and partnerships for uh, human capital uh, building across uh, the regions. And so this really uh, strengthens the relationship and allows it to, to survive. And actually China's development projects in the region, whether it's infrastructure building, whether it is training citizens and like uh, bureaucrats or students and so on, is not matched by any Western country. The EU has, but you know, in, in recent years, it has like uh, disinvested in a way. And Washington is, is there, there, like the US has some scholarship programs for students across the region, but we don't see the Americans being interested in building infrastructure in Tunisia or Morocco or elsewhere in the region. And so the Chinese have a huge comparative advantage in the sense that like they are able to uh, be present in these countries uh, by providing the, the you know development <laughs> in a way that uh, the Americans or Europeans uh, 
and not. Uh, regarding the private sector, yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's very important to uh, what we mean. There are a lot of uh, private. Uh, we have some independent entrepreneurs, especially from the south of China, coming to do private business uh, in a, or in Morocco, so people opening restaurants or uh, importing uh, textiles, like kickstarting uh, little garment factories. Uh, in instance, in which uh, when it comes also to uh, North Africans going to southern China trade mainly. So there's well reported work on uh, Algerians, for instance, going to Shenzhen mm -hmm. to import and bring them back informally to, to jump to the informality section, to bring them back in suitcases and sell them uh, informally in the, the Algerian market. Uh, so we see a lot of these uh, happening. It has slowed down since COVID. And especially that now many uh, private North African entrepreneurs are not anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have about only five minutes before the end of the program, since a lot of our students are um, probably have other commitments. So, uh, Tina, uh, Lina, if you can uh, uh, answer these two questions very quickly. And then as we started, we'll close off with Dr. Mordechai from uh, from Israel, please, oh, Lena. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, in uh, trying to be conscious of, of, of the uh, remaining time we have, I'll just um, maybe say a couple of uh, remarks on this question of sustainability of Sino Maghreb uh, relations. I mean, it's, um, you know, a dose of competition is always good. And this is something that, um, you know, elites from across the African continent keep repeating, and they're very, you know, um, cognizant, so to speak, of the opportunities that some of these kind of, uh, you know, thinking about this competition coming from the US or coming from uh, Europe and so on and so forth can bring to them. So the, the, there's a there's a way to look at this in terms of opportunities, in terms of potential, in terms of what this those that this competition can 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 bring to the market. Uh, and in this regard, um, it is China's real competition in the Maghreb, the way I see it. It's actually not coming from traditional um, uh, players uh, or from the U.S., uh, but it's it's mainly coming from uh, Turkish companies, uh, right? So lots of Turkish companies have been uh, observed to uh, gain uh, contracts that were originally given to Chinese companies, or there are some uh, a, a variety of reconsidering, renegotiating, and rethinking uh, infrastructure projects uh, in, in in the continent. And a lot of it comes, uh, you know, we see Turkey and Turkish companies coming up as a real alternative or as a real, as a more kind of concrete uh, competition to Chinese companies. Um, so, um, so Turkish companies, we, we also see Russia coming in sort of from this kind of security aspect. Uh, we also know, uh, we see uh, also uh, about um, investments from, from the Gulf in terms of energy cooperation as well. Um, but in terms of China, um, China's uh, uh, relations moving forward in, in, in the future in the continent, there are also other sorts of uh, and sources of uh, challenges. I was reading an article just today that was talking about how um, in uh, two years ago, there were more PhD uh, students who uh, from Ghana uh, who got their PhDs from Chinese universities than, than, than there were PhD students that same year who got their degrees from Ghanaian universities. But the problem was, the article was talking about today, was that when these students come back with Chinese degrees, when they come back to Ghana, they have been facing issues with employment because their employers just still see that they have sort of a, a, a way of just thinking about sort of a degree coming from a European university is somehow viewed as more credible than a degree coming from a Chinese university. So that really presents this kind of really moving forward, right? So yes, we have this human capital. Yes, we have this social capital. Yes, we have this capital. How can it translate moving forward to you know, sort of really changing uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the livelihoods of of these students who go on these scholarships to China. So these are questions that are going to be really important uh, moving forward in the next five to 10 years. 
in terms of really translating that capital into uh, uh, tangible material uh, uh, changes. So um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll leave it here and um, I'll be happy to carry on the conversation at other uh, opportunities, hopefully. Thank you. We look forward definitely to having you more often, you and uh, Tin Hanan as well. Um, Dr. Mordechai, I hope uh, you can really be concise uh, in your reply. Um, let's say within two minutes if possible okay. so we can close the session okay i think in the future the balance of uh, global politics will um, affected by china's maghreb uh, relationships uh, and the interest uh, governance but as i said in the presentation it is unlikely that china will become hegemony in the region and um, and I do not think uh, uh, for now, this relation will uh, cause more trouble in the relationship uh, be, be, between China and the Middle and the, um, and the US. There are uh, a lot of field that <laughs> uh, will be more important for the Maghreb. As I said, the Maghreb is imported to uh, China only for economic and, uh, and geographical for the uh, BR, BRI. And so I do not think that China is into to the military field, you know. Um, so this relationship are not uh, uh, jeopardize the, the relations when the, when the US. Um, so if I conclude, I think that this was not um, a problem for the uh, US or the uh, European uh, for now. But in the future, if this uh, 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 partnership will become more and more uh, important, this might uh, could uh, be a trouble for the West. Thank you very much. Um, you know, th these are big questions that I think we'll, we'll hear more uh, more of uh, as as the United States engage engages Africa uh, and North Africa, uh, as we've seen that with recent trips by senior U.S. officials in the region, including um, the director of the CIA. Uh, but but I think uh, the lesson here for the U.S. specifically is that to engage with the region is for the U.S. to go back to its original approach to foreign policy in the 50s and 60s, where it invested in these countries uh, and, and established relationships that are win-win for both, instead of approaching it from this negative perspective that it's always a security problem, it's always a potential disaster, and uh, it's always a problem how we can get Russia out of it or get China out of it. I think uh, this is, the, for me, is the, the, the great uh, cleverness of the, of the Chinese policy. And I, I think I agree with you, Dr. Mordechai, that yes, now it's just an economic issue, but I think like the United States started also as an economic power, just was interested in investment and so on. And it will turn into much more political and strategic relationship, uh, especially as Lina also pointed out that, uh, the Chinese model is a very attractive model in North Africa and also in the Middle East. I've seen that among the monarchies of the of, of uh, the Gulf, for example, who always saw uh, China as a model where they can liberalize their economies, develop it, but without uh, conceding power um, and political uh, control. So China presents a very, very serious challenge to the United States. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, North African countries are, let me put it very bluntly, it's sick and tired of their region being subcontracted to France, uh, as the United States has done for many years, or to England. Um, and and uh, these are colonial powers uh, with a horrible histories in North Africa, even though the relationship is there, but there is still this popular resentment for this. The United States is now even subcontracting the region to countries in the Gulf uh, who have interfered very blatantly in North Africa, something very new. Um, and I think there is a resentment that's going on from the population there. Why, why are these guys coming over here to 
to influence our politics or, I mean, in Libya and so on. Anyway, um, to conclude, I thank you all very much, especially our great students who are here, uh, our guests, uh, and uh, the, the larger uh, audience on Zoom. I apologize for the technical problems, but and I hope you keep up with us. We're going to try to do other events on, on this region. And uh, uh, I think our next event, we're thinking about also uh, exploring the Russian involvement in North Africa and Africa in general, uh, which is a very uh, focused interest of the United States foreign policy these days. Mm -hmm. um, so please, uh, we look forward to having you next time. Thank you very, very much. To our speakers. We'll have the video and the presentation tomorrow, fingers crossed, on our website. So please uh, all uh, look at it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you we much. have lunch here for those. But this is why you missed uh, coming here because we have a great lunch here. So we're going to grab our lunch. Enjoy. <laughs> and you it. guys have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes.